Hi, you're watching the fan carpet. I'm Annabelle Spinks Jones. We're here for the UK premiere and the launch of Dead Ringer. Enjoy. How did you find the transition from um, television to film? I've, I've worked in both fields for a long time now. Um, yeah, most of my stuff has been in TV, but it's uh, it's all part of the same medium, really. Um, just on a bigger scale, generally. So, yeah, no, it's great. And this is my second movie, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's bigger and better than the last one, we think. Um, hopefully the audience will agree. Could you tell us a bit about the conception of Dead Ringer? How did it first get going? Yeah, well, April last year, my business partner Richard came to me and said, Amar, I've got this idea for a script, and it's based around the pop industry, and I know a lot of people in the industry, so I thought, why not have a read of the script? Read the script, within 80 to 85 minutes I read it, and I didn't put it down. So for me, it was a no-brainer. I said, let's make this, and by August, we were shooting the movie. Amazon release for this one. Um, what do you see as the future for um, cinema and distribution of films in the next 10, 20 years? Weirdly, I think cinemas come back a bit, but DVDs dropped a bit now. Um, that's struggling, and obviously digital downloads and things like that haven't quite taken over, but that seems to be the preferred medium for everybody to watch something on now. That's a very good question. I get asked that a lot. DVD market has dropped by 50% in the last couple of years. It's totally going, and TV and digital are taken over to, in an immense way. Um, and I really think that's the next stage, you know, do theatrical release, and then obviously DVDs are slowly, slowly going lower and lower. But we've just got to go with it and see. I don't know, with Netflix and series and stuff like that, I think um, people, a lot of people are watching TV and get really excited for series. Um, it'd be a shame if it took over cinema releases and films. Uh, I love going to cinema and I love films, but I also love the Netflix series. I think it's all in a really good place at the minute. Um, but yeah, just have to see what happens. The things are changing, the way people are consuming is changing. You know, I know I watch a lot more online now, so this one is a lot more going to that online audience and obviously getting the buzz around it and getting people to kind of talk about it. And um, so yeah, I think, I, think, I think online people are consuming. Yeah, I know I watch films at home and Amazon and Netflix and iTunes is where I'm going to watch stuff and obviously catch up on, on BBC and things. So things are changing. So filmmakers have to adapt with that and make things to suit that audience. And obviously people want to watch whenever they want. And um, and also there's a lot of content out there so you've got to make it kind of you know, stand out and people got to talk about it so, um, so yes it's not easy but we're adapting well actually very little I think there's a big crossover now between um, uh, TV actors and film actors I think there was a bit of a taboo quite a long time ago um, but I think that's slowly and incrementally um, people are finding that you're not just sort of pigeonholed as being a TV actor or a film actor I think that the crossover now um, is, um, is, is quite um, obvious for all to see um, which I think is good because I mean you can sort of just hang around doing film acting for a long time and not be appreciated with TV acting. I, at the end of the day actors are actors and we're, we're all scratching around for a living. And the way forward isn't it just straight out there Amazon, Netflix, it's the way that it goes now. It's the same with the magazines, it's all online now. It's just what you have to do and it just gets it out there quicker and it, it's just the best way forward I think. I think British film are making incredible moves in the in, in, the, in the world actually. I think that we're, we're respected um, for our, um, our consistency and our persistency, like we, I don't think um, most British independent directors get enough credit because they push hard, they work hard, and they love what they do. And I think they, that shows in the film as well. Well, I think it's difficult because obviously the American market seems to take everything. Anything that's you know got any money involved, the American market take it. And it's nice to see little British films like this coming through, taking the limelight for once. And I've got nothing but good positive vibes for the for the UK market. And what made you want to get involved? Um, I spoke to Amar. I spoke to Amar. He um, actually spoke to me on Twitter, and I've seen him been doing um, a f f films previous, and I was just really excited to be involved. Um, massive opportunity and yeah so he got in touch and luckily he thought I fit the criteria for a part so that's how it came about. I got approached by the director after doing their last film um, which was Dangerous Game back in 2016 uh, the part's about a boy band, and that's basically where my life's uh, been revolved around for the past few years. Like I was in a boy band when I was younger. I suppose this is basically um, what you see now. Yeah. 
so I've known the producers Amar and Richard for about two years now um, they gave me a scene in the drugs lab which was really out there and I just thought amazing I mean it's a, a brilliant production the team are just incredible I've seen them year on year just grow and intertwine the kind of reality industry with the independent film industry um, and it's just incredible absolutely love it and I'm great to be a part of it so um, I mean I was uh, an early stage in the sort of talks with um, Amara and Richard about what film we're going to do and we were discussing which one would have the right balance of commerciality and fun and uh, experience with the audience so this one we had three scripts we were looking at uh, and then this one kind of stood out because it had the music element into it it was very topical it's very up to date had some cool characters in it so we knew we were going to be able to make a really fun film that people are going to enjoy so that's why this one got chosen well Amar is amazing. He's always such a good producer. He always comes up with like the most exciting plot lines. And he just called me up and he said, we need someone that looks like a very scary, short-haired lunatic with a pump-action shotgun. And I said, I'm your girl. Let's do it. Oh, I heard of it uh, quite some time ago um, um, when I was chatting to Amar and Richard. And um, they, they asked me if I wanted to play uh, a part. And I said, yeah, absolutely. You know, anything to support, uh, support my friends. So, yeah, um, got involved in it and um, played Lenny Valentine, the pub landlord. Eastern pub landlord, lovely guy. <laughs> Get out of my pub. Get out of my pub, you bard. No, it wasn't that bad. I want people to come in. <laughs> the more the merrier. Well, I've already done a film with um, the producer and director of this film already, previously. So they obviously, they liked the work that I've done before and they contacted me and said, oh look, we've got a new film, it's about a boy band, there's a bit of drugs, there's a bit of violence, there's a bit of this. And I was like, yeah, that sounds like me. So I jumped on board, done an audition and then now here we are. I hear that this is the first time you'll be seeing it. Yes, it is. Actually, it's the first time I'm going to know what is this story about. I have no idea. So uh, it sounds like you had a lot of faith in the filmmakers to just get involved. Yeah, so actually, well, I would, uh, I know Richard and Amar, and uh, Richard said, Mars, do you want to be in it? I say, yeah, definitely. So he wrote a little part for me, one of the scenes, I end up kissing a boy. <laughs> and uh, that's all I'm going to tell you. <laughs> um, what's your ritual getting ready for an on screen kiss? Oh, you know, it was uh, kind of interesting. You know, uh, he was so ugly, so I had to try so much. No, I'm joking, he was very pretty and young, so it was easy. <laughs> So did you slip him some mints and get a hinting? No, actually, actually, I had this uh, little spray for the mouth because, you know, you never know, no? So I was between takes. Yeah. Uh, and then I say, what is that, Marsha? I say, no, I want to be fresh. <laughs> Favourite boy band? It's got to be Take That, hasn't it? Take, take That. It's got, you know, back in the, I mean, obviously that's showing my age, but those guys, Robbie, back, Rocky, back in the early days, I mean, those guys are the best. Boy band? Well, I'm not in a boy band, so it can't be my own. Um, I'm going to say Backstreet Boys. Yeah. Why not? Oh, what, from now or from when I was actually listening to boy band? When, whenever. The Beach Boys. Beach Boys. Yeah. I just thought I'd throw it back to the retro. Yeah. Or maybe like Backstreet Boys. Let's just go with something with boy in the title. Favourite boy band? Oh. Oh wow, there's so many. Westlife. Done. Done. Yeah. What song? I'm flying without wings and so impossible on the sunrise in your face. That's coming out. You know that I could say I love you. In any given time or place, all oh, the wind up inside you. God damn! Yeah. That's enough. <laughs> Right. That's hard. It's hard. It's between Jagged Edge or 112. Or, actually, the best album I've heard, R&B wise, from Boy Band, is probably the Three Kings, which is I don't know if you know who they are. That's Tank, Shamaric, 
is it Jamaica? Yeah. No, no. Was it Tank? Genuine, that's it. Genuine and Tyrese. Baddest album. It's called The Three Kings. Check that out. Gosh, we see I'm a lot older. I see I, I can go back to the Jacksons you know, when they were boys and they were still alive, half of them. Um, but today, yeah, listen, it's got to be, uh, it's got to be take that, hasn't it? Because as much as I don't like some of their songs, they stick in your head. And watch your bed for good and all that. That's terrible. Gary Barlow doing big things in the West End. Lovely, lovely. Yeah, listen, as I said, you know, each their own. I mean, my, my, my favourite era was the 80s. I grew up with, you know, Blondie and those kind of um, sort of hits from, from the 80s. I liked all that. But listen, there's a place for everybody. I mean, as long as you've got a good taste and varied taste in music, there's, there's room for us all. How do you go about casting for a project like this? So many, um, such a big cast. We knew because of the subject matter, because of the canvas we'd painted it on within the pop industry, etc., that we wanted lots of music cameos. We knew we wanted lots of film, big film names as well, to kind of prop up the film, if you like, bolster it. Um, we also knew that, um, that our forte, really, from the films we've done before to now, is using reality stars and TV stars, if you like, too. So if we can pull them all in in a, an interesting mix and we could make it work, we knew it would be great. So that's what we, that's what we did. Um, casting it and choosing who was going to be in it, that took a little bit of time because you had still had to choose who was right for what role. But yeah, I think, I think my casting director and producer um, did a good job helping me out with that. It was amazing. I'm so grateful for, um, for everything from the film, but we got, we got a lovely trip over to the US. I love the US. I'm a massive fan of America. Um, Americans were in the film as well. We've got some great characters, great American characters in the film. Great locations from Florida, St. Petersburg, Clearwater. Um, the US has been amazing, actually. We, we premiered the film over there in Sundial uh, Film Festival. Um, and, yeah, it was amazing. So you'll get to see the film tonight. Uh, the UK will. And hopefully they'll take it as well as the US did. Your character doesn't seem to have much in common with you. How did you go about getting into character? I spoke to them all. Um, they were interested in me playing one of the band members. Um, and if I'm honest I said it's, it's too obvious um, don't really want to do that and he agreed and I said is there any other characters left because they practically cast the film they had two or three and I said well what's the Venom head character well, what's all that about and he said oh it's just a small role you won't want that and I was like no tell me it's a uh, homeless druggie really he's Jason Venom head and he gets into the drugs somehow there's, I think there's a lot more to him than people know he's a very small part in this film but we don't really know much about him um, he's definitely got a connection with one of the, the main characters in there be him he'll appear in the second one or not I don't know but for me as a, an actor you know it was great to play because it's a world away from who I really am uh, I'm excited to see this film tonight uh, it was shot in Florida I think which is amazing and they've also recorded original music for the film so I think they're releasing both the CD as well as the film itself so you know amazing I've got a memorable day which is probably when we flew to Florida and actually flew on the day two days before Hurricane Irma so our actual shooting schedule got pushed by a week because I was in a toilet for two days with water and a bit of rations. So the lengths to go to to make a movie, it's all worth it in the end, but that was my most memorable day, definitely, by far. So were you, were you stuck when you say you were in a toilet with rations? We were stuck. We had to just sit there for two days, not allowed out. We had a curfew, we weren't allowed anywhere. So for us, we just sat in the toilet with candles, hoping that we had electricity. And it all got cut off and we just had to sit there for 48 hours in the toilet, in the bathroom, hidden away. Amar just told us about uh, kind of uh, uh, filming in Florida and also that um, sev The Seven is going to be uh, influenced by Stranger Things and Scream. Um, seems like there's a lot of kind of vintage old school influences these days. What were your favourite horror movies growing up? You know, I wasn't a horror fan growing up. I'm kind of, I scare quite easily, so I'm someone who's behind the sofa going, Ooh! don't show me um, but I've actually found myself working more and more in horror recently I had a film at Fright Fest a few weeks ago called Heretics about a group of nuns that were being sort of there was this curse taking over the convent and then people started dying so it's a genre that I'm getting more and more interested in um, yeah and I just it's fantastic to have all these amazing opportunities yeah we just dodged Irma yeah which was uh, crazy I couldn't believe that it was uh, we, we basically went over there the day after the Irma finished um, our producer was actually over there in the time I think he was hiding in the bathroom somewhere 
Yeah, so who's that guy? Yeah, we've heard he was stuck in a toilet with rations and, and puddles and stuff. Exactly, yeah. I think he had a few biscuits to, to keep, him, keep him happy. I know you might not be able to share too much about filming, but are there any particular days on set that you can recall? Any particular moments on set that you'd like to share? There's one moment, well, I shouldn't give too much away. Uh, one of the actors appears in an air hostess costume at one moment, which was quite funny. It was quite hilarious watching him practicing walking in the heels in the dressing room backstage. Um, and he has some quite, he has quite a cool death as well. I won't say what it is, but it's really, really cool. Well, high heels in themselves are a horror story all of their own. Hard enough, and I've been wearing them for years, so he had like an hour to learn how to walk in high heels. And we had a Ouija board scene as well, and some of the girls were scared that we were actually going to really summon a ghost or something. But I think, fingers crossed, I think we're all right. Nothing followed me home, I think. And on the subject of high heels, um, last year, um, Cannes Film Festival banned high heels on the red carpet. Um, what are your views on that? I think they've got a, a really good point. I think it's, um, you know, I believe in women's equality, I believe in feminism, I believe that we shouldn't have to put up with the things that we put up with. Um, I am wearing heels today, so in a sense that's kind of hypocritical, but uh, yeah, I think they were quite right. Good for them. Yeah, ap apologies. I should have said Cannes didn't ban aisles. They banned flat shoes on the red carpet. Right. But, but some of the women protested that rule, and of course, good for them. What, you can't be dictated to. You can't tell me what to wear. You know, and you can go and watch a film. It, it's, it's about your talent as an actress or a producer or a director. It doesn't matter what you wear on your feet. Totally. With huge budget TV, um, things like HBO um, really taking off, what is the difference between TV and film at the moment? TV probably has a lot more platforms, so does, so does um, film, you know, as long as we can get it out there and put it into different places, we can, we, can, we can do that, so there's no end, no end to any film, as long as we do what we love and make good content and good stuff, we're good. Any particular challenges during shooting or a, a particular day on set that you can recall? No, not really. Um, the thing with this film is from the, very, the, from the moment everybody read the script and uh, got involved, Everybody gave 110% because they all loved the idea, they loved the concept and uh, I couldn't have asked anything more from anybody. We didn't have one bad day, if that's possible, on a film set. It was great. Yeah. Favourite day on set? I think like, the first day was the most scariest, it was, it was the most uh, um, nerve-wracking, I didn't know any, any of the crew, any of the team uh, jumping in at the deep end with my first lead role in a, in a film and I think that um, it, was just, it was just phenomenal as well, it was just like an exciting experience. Um, you might see that, it was one of the last scenes, you might see how nervous I was in the last scene. I think just spending time with the boys um, on the set and the girls, uh, the, all the team were just uh, a lot of fun and really good people so every day were a good do. Fantastic, yeah, and that was uh, echoed by Amar who said it was a real family vibe on set. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was like a real family vibe, everyone were really close, and yeah, it, it were amazing. Some days are more laborious than others, and especially if you have a lot to learn, um, and you, sometimes you don't appreciate what's going on around you because you've got to focus on what you're doing. Um, but sometimes it's nice just to watch other people earn their corn, so to speak. So for me, um, it, it's, it, there's, no, there's no particular favourite day, every day is, is nice to be on set. It's probably uh, six weeks in total, but when we went to Florida, obviously you've got the weather, you've got the palm trees, I think the first day we arrived in Florida we were on these keys, uh, and it just felt like like a mini Miami Vice, we were like brilliant. You know, I was in the DA jacket. We we're in the, we had the boats there, and the sun was shining, and that was pretty, pretty special. It was kind of like getting that real, um, yeah, that Florida vibe in the film as well. So hopefully that'll come through. Uh, and I heard it wasn't always um, sunshine and splendour in Florida. Tell us a bit about the hurricane. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so yeah, before it happened, actually, this time last year, basically there was a hurricane, as it's happening now. So in the lead up to um, going over there, we were like, are we going to make it? And even the, I think two days before, we were like, should we go? Should we not go it was um, it was kind of like yeah we were just basically checking with them like what the weather was like and I think some of the people didn't want to go because they thought it was going to be that dangerous but actually when we got there it completely gone and a beautiful sunshine hardly saw any damage so we were very lucky literally it was just it just blown over so very lucky and fantastic we got the film there it made a massive difference to the film and do you know what? I think even in the green room when everyone's resting between takes there's just such a great atmosphere everybody's a family everyone's chatting laughing and you just feel such a part of it it's it's almost a shame when it's over because you miss everyone and to go back and be a part of that is something that's so rare and it's so genuine. Um, I just absolutely love it. When you play Detective Green in Dead Ringer, obviously you did 
detective uh, genre is hugely popular in this country. Um, who's your uh, favourite famous detective? Oh, that's a good call. In real life or on, t on screen? Either. Gosh, I mean, when I grew up, I used to remember watching Poirot with my family, obviously. But he had that little bit, yeah, he was quite quirky and it was very classic and it was period and he was, yeah, with the, with the, with the, uh, the moustache and everything. But I guess now things are changing, you know, so there's new detectives out there. Um, so, yeah, I watch a Luther I love. I mean, Idris is brilliant in that. And there's obviously a lot of things are changing now. There'll be a lot of new sort of style detectives coming through. So this one's probably more than classic style of detective but um so yeah maybe one day i get to do a uh, I get the old moustache on and do something period as well how much do you feel that you had in common with your um character and how did you get into that role um, well i'm from leeds and my character's from down south so i had to put on a, a london accent um so i tried my best to do what i could uh, hopefully people will see, try and see if it's kind of not authentic as such but see if i can pull it off it's quite quite a challenging endeavor um, were there particular mates or anything that you had to hang around with? You find yourself talking on the phone to a lot of Londoners. No, I've got a lot of friends who are from down south, and um, I've and I've always watched films, British films. So I just kind of took it off that really. I've never been in a drugs lab before. I've never never been a gangster. Um, but equally, like the atmosphere is just so incredible. When you step on set, you just you get in that mode. Everybody's in character, and you just you transport yourself. So yeah, it was it's pretty easy to do. Um, and as I say, it just came alive. It's something that I think everybody should see. How did you cope with the nerves on the first day and getting into character for such a big responsibility? Yeah, so the first character that I played was actually Jamie. Um, I think I come, I think I'm closer to Jamie. I think I get Jamie. Jamie's um, been working hard all his life. He, he has loads of troubles around him as well, but he doesn't let that bother his career and his path, and he just stays driven. Um, and yeah, I kind of took that into consideration. I think, yeah, I enjoy playing Jamie the most, I think. Donnie's quite, Donnie's an accomplished um, boy band singer who's already been there, done that. He's got the arrogance behind him. That's also fun to play, but I like the, 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 the desperate uh, the desperate times of Jamie. It's cool, you can get your, get your teeth stuck into it. And of course you played two characters essentially in the film. Um, how did you differentiate between the two? Did you ever have to play two characters in one day, for example? Yeah, exactly. So uh, one of the things that you'll see at the end, it was a split screen of Jamie and Donnie. Uh, they're at a the table. I won't give too much away. It's basically the end. I've just given it away. Um, this is going out after the film. It's fine. Um, so yeah, so they have a bit of a face-off, and that was it was exhausting, yeah, to say the least. But it was lovely. It was, it was challenging and fun. And I had to play one character, come out of character, and play the next, and keep on doing that throughout the day. It was fun. Well, my character's sort of. Um, He's not the main character in, in the boy band, and he doesn't really like the fact that the, the, the main singer gets all the attention, and he's like, do you know what, you know, it's a, it's a boy band, we're all together. And I'm more like that, I don't like people taking the solo life. I think it, when it's a group thing, it's a group thing, you know, so I like to, to bring the boy band together, whereas the main guy, I like to take the boy band away, and that's where we should probably in common. But obviously, when you're acting, you rarely play your own character, so I took parts of me and then adapt it with Dominic and we made Dom. Loads, that's why I'm typecast because I do, I, I play Lou the drug dealer and the way I come across doing drug deals is nice and easy for me being from South London. So for me, I didn't even have to act. I was just being me. So it is, it follows basically a, uh, a boy band and a guy uh, he's the, the lead singer of a very famous band and he is um, there's a change of um, <laughs> they basically one character um, passes away and then they, they want to replace based on the Paul McCartney conspiracy theories they want to replace the lead singer of this band without anyone noticing so they find someone who looks like the lead singer bring him in and continue the, the, the boy band but the kind of message of it is about striving for su success and this kind of obsession we all have with trying to be successful uh, and it's about putting in the hard work obviously and then there's a kind of there's the, the band are being used as a front for a drug smuggling operation so there's kind of another that's where the crime comes into it and the detective comes into it. 
big transition for you, um, changing into acting. Is acting going to be your main focus going forward? I, I like acting. I'm learning as I go. Um, I went to stage school. I did small drama courses at school. Obviously, I'm not afraid of the stage. So I've done the West End and I've done touring plays and things like that. Um, but film is very different. You know, I like to look down a lens. I don't like to avoid a lens. So it's it's difficult and it's going to take me a while. But I'm learning as I go. I think this is the fourth feature film I've been in now. Um, and yes, I'm. I'm trained for the stage, I'm trying to train myself for a film. So hopefully I'm, I'm doing okay and I'll hopefully only get better the more I do. And what are the challenges of transitioning from stage to screen? Um, did you find yourself very big in, in your style in the first film you did maybe? I think the, the challenge really is just learning learning as you go, learning when the lights are, learning what you know your scene partners are doing. Um, cut, do it again. You've got to go back into that frame of mind. You've got to go back into that emotion. Did I move my hand at a certain point? Did I drink in a certain way you know continuity has to be bang on so depending how many takes you're going to do and that's that's something again you learn stage it's live if you go wrong you go wrong you blag it and you get on with it you improvise over it and you hope the audience hasn't noticed it depending if it's a pant or if it's a straight play it doesn't matter um, but for film you know it's nice that you can retake it don't get me wrong um, if you make a mistake go forward with it but make sure the continuity is there remember what you've done and yeah like I said it's a massive learning curve I see diversity I see everybody not finally being able to get chances to follow their dreams and not be labelled or put into a box to say that you're not allowed to step out of that lane to come and do something else. I've always believed in triple threats ever since I got into Blue and that's all I've ever ever tried to do and it's taken 20 years to actually have people be, being able to make independent movies like this. My sister-in-law's in the movie as well. That's what we're here to do to support and it's all about those independent people out there that want to take their, take their game to the next level. Sofa or cinema? Ooh, you know what? I love the cinema. I love going out with friends. I love going out for a meal first, having a chat and then sitting down watching a movie, getting your popcorn out. I do love it. I do think it's a dying breed at the moment though. I do think things are taking over, which is a shame, a big shame, but I like to get out and I do like to go to the cinema. Oh, always cinema for me, but only when I'm standing outside a cinema. If I wasn't, I'd be on the bloody sofa, so don't you worry. So yeah, my sofa's quite nice actually, yeah, <laughs> sofa. Or a cinema with a sofa in it. <laughs> cinema in your house? I don't think I'm allowed. Wifey? <laughs> Would, would, would I be allowed to, uh, uh, come here? Uh, I don't even have to ask the wife that. I've asked him, cinema or sofa? Sofa? What about cinema in the house? Uh, we've got quite a big screen TV. Yeah, we have actually, yeah. It's, it's huge. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's huge. It's almost, it's, we've got half a cinema. So we never get or three quarters of a cinema. So <laughs> we never make it out. Yeah. Oh, well, that rather depends. I mean, sometimes you just want to lounge at home with a, with a bottle of wine, some peanuts and popcorn, tacos. Oh, showing, them, showing them what I do now. Um, listen, both are different. Sometimes you want to escape the um, confines of your home, go out and have a lovely evening, a meal out, and whatever. Sometimes it's just nice to stay at home. So, you know, depends what, you're, uh, what, you're, what you prefer on who you're with. Do you know, I think a lot of people go to the cinema, but the majority at home on a Saturday night, they have children, or they actually think, do you know what, I want it here and now. I want it on my iPad, I want it on my phone. Um, I think it's only going to get bigger and better. And definitely, people like this, independence, it, it fuels the industry, and it's amazing, and it's something that shouldn't be snuffed at, it should be celebrated, um, and I think it will just snowball. <laughs> John Rowe, well, I was DJing on Sunday Force Radio the other day. I've been DJing, uh, I started off at a Ministry of Sound many, many years ago, but I DJ all over the world. I've just done, uh, last year, a whole season in uh, Ibiza. This season I was in uh, Tenerife. Wednesday I'm flying out to DJ back in uh, Sweden. So I've done about 10 countries this year. A lot of crossover today. There's reality TV, there's um, uh, actors, producers, directors, all, all in one. Uh, where do you see the future of cinema in the next 10 years? I think you're possibly looking at the future, if I'm really honest. I think social media and reality and all that is starting to have a massive part in this world, let's be honest. Um, and I think what I liked about Amar, and the producer of the show, who's also in the film, um, he basically says he likes to give everybody a try. Now, be that you've had experience, you haven't had experience. Um, and I, I sort of I admire that, really. And there's a lot of people out there that don't get that chance. There's also a lot of people out there that work very hard and don't get the chance and are good at what they do. So it's sort of how it blends, how it works and how it's put together but be it good or bad I think the social media side the reality side everything is starting to take over and I think it's all becoming one and that's what you're seeing tonight I don't think there's a massive difference to be fair 
SCTV is very in the moment, it's spontaneous, it's gritty, it's raw. And I think independent filmmakers definitely capture that realness. Um, I think everybody should support it. Definitely British made films. And year on year, they just become amazing with what they create. And it's something that should be celebrated. Oh, God, I'll tell you what, the reality TV, it's, it, I mean, it doesn't matter what you do, it's all entertainment. So there's a lot of people that cross over from being models, they always end up in films, as you know, right? So it's the same with the music industry, the entertainment industry, it's all the same, it's all one big bag, one big circle. And social media is the way forward. I'm an ambassador for like V Aesthetic, so I'm very much on like health and beauty and being positive. I'm also an ambassador for the National Autistic Society, so that's another thing that I work with, where just all about understanding, awareness, and just getting out there and just being yourself. I mean, I'm a social influencer, so I'm in reality TV and influencing anyway. I would love to get more into acting, and definitely this be my second movie. It's something that I'd love to pursue. Um, so I guess just watch this space, really. But here you're a producer yourself, is that right? Yes, I am producer. Uh, I have uh, produced a movie called Heretics uh, with the director Paul Hyatt, and now I'm producing another movie called The Foreseen with uh, Anthony Melton and Ben Franklin. Uh, it's going to be my next hit. And sometimes I do acting. So tell me a little bit about your upcoming project. Well, I'm involved in a film called The Seven, which is Amar's next film that's coming out in time for Halloween. It's a horror film. Uh, and it's amazing. It's really, really scary. It's really spooky. I can't say too much about it, but there are some real big uh, scary moments and some interesting deaths and blood and gore, and it's, it's really scary. Um, how did you kind of get back to your centre and calm down after filming something scary? I'm just quite old school and quite simple, just a nice cup of tea and, I don't know, a good book. And, you know, it really, although I think it's very scary when we when you watch it, when it's edited together, it was actually quite fun filming it. We were, like, the cast got on really well, so we were always laughing in between takes. So, um, yeah, just hanging out in the green room, having fun. I'm producing my own film uh, called Two Wrongs, um, which hopefully I'll get over the next year or so. Um, but really tonight's more about supporting my friends, so we'll talk about mine at the more appropriate time. Tonight's all about Richard and Amar, and rightly so, because um, I'm loving the, the wave that they're on. They're doing very, very well, and I'm great to be part of it, and they're good friends of mine, so it's, it's lovely watching them achieving great success, and hopefully um, I'll be able to say in a year or two that I'm doing the same thing. I have just released a clothing brand called Filthy Hooker, conveniently. Um, it's a fishing brand. It's just like clothing for all that sort of stuff. Yeah, fishing. So you're not wearing fish fishing. I'm not right now. This is. I am wearing filthy hooker. <laughs> no, no, not today. Um, no, this. I, I, I've just. I, I prefer the business side of things rather than the camera side of things. So I'm just trying to make businesses go in in the background. We'll see though. We've got a lot of things going on. I don't know. My agent's got loads of little TV propositions. So we'll see. I don't know. Fishing movie. Fishing horror game. <laughs> Be like Jaws, the retake or something like that. And I, mega Jaws, yeah, we'll do something like that, yeah. I've got a few things, yeah. I'm speaking to a director in LA uh, right now um, from Sonder Pictures, actually. Uh, he's a great guy. Um, a guy called Mike. Yeah, we, we're talking. We're talking about a film. I won't give too much away, but yeah, well, I've got a couple of projects in the in the pipeline. So acting is definitely uh, where I'm going to be going from now. Thanks for tuning in to the Fan Carpet. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for more updates. See you next time. All I'm saying is that by now, Donnie Martin would be dead by now. Donnie Martin, come at him, face me like a man! Thank you for watching the fan carpet. If you like this video, be sure to click that thumbs up button at the bottom of your screen. And also be sure to subscribe to the fan carpet YouTube channels. They're absolutely free. That's so much fun too. Be sure to check out the official website, thefancarpet.com. Also, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay up to date with reviews, competitions, the latest news, and so much more.